Glad you're here. And I, I want to tell you a story, uh, something that happened to me. Um, when I was about 12, uh, my mom uh, started getting really weird. Um, and uh, she, it was like you would walk in the house and you didn't know whether she was going to be like as sweet as a six-year-old girl or if she was going to be like Mrs. Mean and Nasty and, you know, take your head off. And, uh, and, and uh, like pretty soon after, after a few months of this, it was like you would, you would come home from school at 3 o'clock and the bedlam would begin and everybody would be in turmoil, you know, until bedtime or beyond. Um, and... Uh, and um, just, she would just do the craziest things. I remember one time she, she goes into my closet, gets all my jeans, and cuts them all into jean shorts. Like, it's like, Perry, I, you needed some shorts, and I just helped you out. You know, it was like, what did you do to my jeans? You know? And, uh, and uh, she had, uh, like, we would have these weird arguments. Like, um, like she, she would tell my dad, you know, Bob, you are so mean to me, but, but you know, you're not the real Bob, and I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm looking forward to when the real one comes back, because you're just kind of this in-between guy. You know, you're, and it was just this weird, totally bizarro stuff. And, um, and like, every, everybody's, um, you know, like, wow, what's up with her? And... Uh, See, she had this, she had this, this wicker flower pot basket that she would wear on her head, and it, it was just, it was totally weird, and nobody really knew what was going on. And um, well, so my dad was a minister in this fairly large church. He wasn't like the guy; he was one of the guys. And uh, you know, and so when when you're in a when you're in a little community like that, and everybody knows everybody. Um, you know, people start like, wow, what's going on, you know, she's kind of weird, and, and, you know, and rumors start going, and, and everybody kind of knows that she's off her rocker, um, but, uh, but, but they did not, um, they, they interpreted everything that she was doing as some form of rebellion or something, you know, and, uh, and, and so meanwhile, my, me and my brother and sister, we, we'd, have these, we, we'd have these powwows with Dad. We're like, Dad, you wouldn't believe what Mom did. She did this, and she did this, and we argued about this, and Dad, make her stop. And, you know, he's not really in a great position to, like, make all this craziness stop because he's just, you know, having to deal. And so, um, but meanwhile, he's like, He's taking her to doctors and trying to see if there's some kind of a problem. And, uh, and then, but on the other end, he, he's starting to get threatened because his boss is like, well, Bob, you know what scripture says about a pastor who has to be in control of his family and you're not in control of your family and we might have to do something about this. He was totally serious. You know, it was like... Uh, it was like, um, you know, we, we may have to administer some discipline here. And uh, so one day he, he, took, he took mom to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist recognized what this was. She was bipolar, okay? Bipolar with mild schizophrenia, actually. And so he's like, okay, so this is what's going on, and this is what we need to do. We need to put her on this medication. Well... As soon as the church people found out that, uh, that he had taken her to a psychiatrist, they're like, a psychiatrist? That's like, ooh, you know, this kind of thing. And so um, they, they demoted him. I actually had this meeting, like, okay, you know, does anybody think that Bob is still fit to be, you know, in the ministry here? No, don't think so. And so, you know, and so, well, you know, we're going to give you this other job, and you can just edit these books or whatever, and, you know. And so, the, the, uh, it, it, I, I remember this, this day that um, 
the, the, the head pastor guy and this other guy, they, they come over to our house and they're like, well, you know, we're just letting all you guys know that, you know, that because of the problems with your mom and your family, and I don't think you're really fit to be in this position, and so we're, we're asking your dad to resign. Now, you know, asking people to resign isn't that always like, you know, the, 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 the interesting passive-aggressive thing. And uh, so I, at this point, I was 13, and I'm just sitting there, you know, watching all this stuff go on. Now, my sister was 17, or 18 maybe, and she was livid. She, she like got it, right? She's, and and, and, and she, says, she says to this one guy, she goes, she goes, I know what your daughter does at night. Like, if, <laughs> you know, if people knew what I knew, like, you'd be resigning. And he goes, well, Robin, we're not here to talk about us right now we're here to talk about you um and so you know so next sunday you know the announcement goes out well you know because of some problems with betty and the family bob's decided to resign and um and you know it was just this uh um really icky you know you know in every you know, you know how, uh, how people are when, when somebody's been dishonored or, or, or something. They're like, well, well, I don't know. Do I want to talk to him? I go to school the next day. Hey, I heard your dad quit. Like, my dad didn't quit anything. Um, and, but interestingly, um, that psychiatrist was exactly right, and he put mom on medication and immediately this weird stuff just stopped. Actually, it was probably a little excessive, but you know, medication in the early 80s was not what it was today. It was like, it was like, you know, the baseball bat. Okay, we are, we are putting it in, in, in. Yeah, Brad, Brad's worked with this kind of stuff, right? He kind of gets it, right? And, and so, like, it was like flipping a switch, and all of a sudden, mom is, not only is mom very easy to get along with and everything, She's actually kind of docile, and she's also feeling very guilty. Like, whoa, look what I just did to my family and all this kind of stuff. Um, well, actually, she wasn't, that, that came a little later. For a while, she was like, well, Bob, you deserve that because you're such a mean guy. And so, you get a picture where my dad was in, the, in this thing. So, his wife is going bipolar. I mean, how much fun is that, right? You know, and his kids are complaining to him, and he's just, he's just, you know, powerless um, to deal with this whole mess. And, and then, you know, he's getting publicly disgraced, and he's getting demoted, and there's money issues. And, uh, I mean, he is in the crucible, right? I mean, it is just coming from every possible direction. He's got, he's got two teenagers at home, and, and I was uh, um, looking back on this, like, I was just, I was like the obnoxious, attention-craving teenager that does stupid things at school, and I got into a fist fight one day, and you know, just all this stuff, and it just compounds and compounds and compounds. Well, so... Um, we would have these conversations like, Dad, why do you put up with us? You know, Dad, what they're doing to you is wrong. You should just, like, go somewhere else. You just find a different job, or, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and he, it, he just had this conviction that that was not what he should do. His conviction was, no. I'm going to stick this thing out, and I'm going to vindicate myself. Now, the head pastor guy is a very intimidating guy. Uh, um, he's, he's one, in my life, he's one of these people that, um, that left a lot of bruises, but also, also delivered a lot of... He, he, was, he was an extremely um, capable, like... Bible teacher and, you know, slicing and dicing. Um, so, for example, like, 
I understood hyperlinks before hyperlinks ever existed. Why? Who invented hyperlinks? Jewish scribes. They made concordances. It's like, okay, so how many, you know, how many times in the Old Testament does the word commandment appear? Uh, you know, 697 times, and, you know, and it's this word some of the time, and it's this word other times, and, you know, here's where they all are. So, like, if any of you are familiar with the book of Romans, uh, you know, one, one season we, we studied the book of Romans, start Romans 1, verse 1, and you'd take every single word or every single important word, and they would cross references to see this appears here, and this appears here, and this appears here, and this appears here. And uh, after, after 45 minutes, we had gotten through verse 1 and 2. And next week, we will do verse 3, 4, and 5. It took them five years to do Romans. That, that, was my, that was my education, okay? And so, so it's, it's, it's this very scholarly kind of thing combined with the heavy, you know, the hammer, right? And so I, I, I got both, okay? I got a tremendous education um, on one hand, and then I, you know, I got this nasty stuff to go with it. Um, and, and so, actually, let me get a glass of water. So, so dad is sticking it out. I remember we went on vacation, and, and the relatives are like, Man, Bob, you're in a stinky situation. I think you should just like go go do something else. But he stuck it out. And one of the things was he was the only guy who had the balls to stand up to the head honcho. Everybody else was like a yes man, but he was like, "No, I think you're wrong." You know? And and he told he, he told the guy, he said, he said, "You made a wrong judgment." My wife had a medical condition. It was not some rebellion or some sin or whatever. He goes, and you owe her an apology. You know, and, and after a while, it became apparent that he was exactly right. And he got the apology. Okay? And, and he, he got this, you know, very, you know, strong-willed, single-minded kind of guy to back down and change his mind about some pretty significant things. Um, and uh, he, uh, uh, probably six, eight, ten months later, he got reinstated, and he kind of won back his honor, um, and, uh, and, and vin vindicated himself. And, and, uh, and, you know, we would just have these conversations about, you know, what he should do, what he thought he should do. Well, you know, I, I think he was being guided to do that, and he did what he was being guided to do. Um, well, about not very long after things kind of cleared up, he found out he had cancer. Um, and uh, eventually lost the battle with cancer three or four years later. And uh, it occurred to me that um, had, he, had he taken an out, well, so the, one of the things about being in Hawaii, uh, it, it connects to the first time I came to Hawaii, which was when my dad was dying. Um, so we did all the... I mean, it took about three years, and you, know, you guys all know how, you know, chemo and all this crazy stuff that you do, and, and it's the emotional roller coaster, and oh, it's going to get better, and oh, no, it's not. And, it's, and after a while, it was like, uh, no, it's not going to get better. And so, so the, you know, the same, the same uh, you know, the boss that, that, that I referred to earlier, he said, you know, let's... Let's try to do something special for these guys. And so, unbeknownst to us, he sent a letter to everybody else, and he said, um, Bob's always wanted to go to California. He's never been to California before, and it's one of his life dreams. Why don't you send in some money, and we can all send Bob to California. Uh, and $10,000 came in. And this was 1986. You know, $10,000 was real money. It was actually, it was enough money... To, and somebody also loaned us their, their luxury van. And so we, we, we got a tour of the whole Western United States, 
and we also had enough money to go to Alaska and to go to Hawaii and come back. It was a really great trip. And, uh, and so um, this, this, this whole thing um, ended with being very loved and very supported um, and very well taken care of by you know, all these people. And, and it occurred to me later, um, you know, if dad had cut and run, he would have been somewhere else in some new situation where, oh, guess what? Well, the guy we just hired, now, he has cancer now, and, you know, it, w it, it wouldn't have been nearly as good of a situation. And so I remember when I was in college, you know, I'd, I'd always... I'd always been interested in electronic stuff, and I'd been building stereo equipment, all this kind of stuff, and, and so I decided, well, you know, I need to study electrical engineering. And uh, electrical engineering is a bitch. <laughs> it is not an easy um, curriculum, and, and so I was like right in that sophomore, there's kind of the sophomore weed out uh, phase where they're flunking 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of the kids in any given class, and you're feeling really fortunate to get a C plus on some of the tests, and you know, you're hoping that you can just pass the class. Not only that, those classes are really boring and tedious because it's just really rudimentary stuff, and you can't do very much with it yet, okay? And so I'm doing the best I can to get Bs and Cs out of these classes that Fortunately, I'm not flunking out of. And meanwhile, I, I, go to, I go to the arts and sciences department and I take an English class and I get an A. And I'm like, man, it sure is tempting to just like go over and do this. And I really think that if, I think if dad had cut and run, I probably would have quit engineering too. Um, the older I get, the more thankful I am that I didn't do that. Because all of that stuff, like I, I, I think back to my sophomore year, um, I, I was taking classes like differential equations and matrix theory and, and, and all this, you know, and these circuits classes that, where you have to learn all these basics, but I mean, you know, it's like learning scales on the piano or something. Right, well, okay, I can make this sound, but it doesn't sound like Chopin yet. Um, and, and, you know, I just decided, you know what, I, I feel like my heart has been telling me I need to learn this. I, 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 th I think it's pretty safe to assume that if I leave this and go do something easier, I'm never going to come back to it. And I remember when a, some author, somebody in one of my English classes, there was something like, like you know, you, you should, uh, to put it in musical terms, you should go to the woodshed when you're young. <laughs> because, you know, when you're, you're not going to go back to the woodshed when you're 40, usually. And, I, well, I knew this was true, and so I just, I just kind of stuck it out. Well, I, I am so thankful that I did all that stuff because... I have this whole framework in my head. So like, like all the stuff that I talked about um, on the first day of the conference and you know, right angles and everything. I mean, I, I was just giving you sort of the, the public consumption version of, well, you know, this is, this is how I you know, sort things out in my head. You know, it's like, well, okay, most Direct marketers aren't electrical engineers. There's a few that are, though. How many people in this room are electrical engineers? Are, are you? You're not? You're some kind of engineer. What kind of engineer? Well, close, close enough. Okay, okay that, yeah, right. You know, it's like, well, actually, when you have that kind of background, it's really easy to figure out how Google thinks. It's, it's no big deal. It's like, well, of course they do it that way, right? because it's all one big equation. So I want to, um, in, in the time that remains, I, I want to uh, bring up a, a, a few things that, that have been a encouragement to me. Um, one of my favorite stories, um, 
th this is one, it gets, it gets deeper and deeper uh, the, the further I go. Um, one night Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Now, that's a good start. Listen to this dream, he said. We're out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. <laughs> How to win friends and influence people. Right? Now, <laughs> his brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? And you actually think you will reign over us. And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way that he talked about them. Well, at some very deep intuitive level, Joseph knew this was true. And, um, you know, it's, it's like if God gives you a dream, that's like a whole different deal. Um, you know, if, 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 if a therapist tells you how to fix your head probably doesn't work. If God tells you how to fix your head, it has this funny way of working. I've experienced that. Um, and uh, and, and I, I really believe that everybody, I, I, I am, I'm absolutely convinced, every single person in this room, there's, there's these little things in your heart that pull you along, and you're like, why am I doing this anyway? This is crazy. There's... Uh, was it a Chevy Chase movie? That's like this is crazy. This is crazy. This is crazy. Like you know, where did I ever get this crazy idea? But for some reason, it won't let go of you, and you just keep you just keep at it. You keep pursuing it. Like nobody seems to understand. Somebody said to me yesterday. He said, you know, I love this group. I'm not a freak. It's like yes, that's right. You're not a freak. And um, and. Uh, well, th this, this, this goes further. Soon, Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream. Whoa, can't wait. The sun, moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. <laughs> this time, he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? He asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come down and bow to the ground before you. But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Well, um, I, I assume most of you have heard this story where his brothers hate him so much that they, they throw him in a pit, they sell him into slavery, slave traders come, they take him to Egypt, get sold to this guy, this guy uh, makes him a servant, Pretty soon, the whole house is running like a well-oiled machine. Like, you, you want a picture of the E-myth? Okay, just read, read the story of, of Joseph running Potiphar's house, right? It says Potiphar, everything was run so well, Potiphar didn't have to worry about anything more significant than what he was going to eat for dinner. That's what it says. So Joseph had this place running that well. Okay, then Potiphar's wife gets the hots for Joseph, and when he turns her down, they throw him in jail, and now he's in prison. And I forget, but I think he was in prison for 12 years or something. Okay, now, now you stop and think about that. You know, you're laying in the prison with the cockroaches and the spiders and the rats and whatever else, and you're eating dry crust of bread for dinner, and, um, you know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> look what I got for, like, being a trustworthy guy, right? Now, I think what's interesting is, um, I hope nobody calls me in the middle of this. Um, I, this is what David said about it. Um, then God sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. He's talking about that, that a famine is coming. They bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dreams. 
the Lord tested Joseph's character. Then Pharaoh sent for him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened up his prison door. Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household. He became ruler of all the king's possessions. He could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and teach the king's advisors. Okay? Now, here, here's, here's what I believe about. I think there are seasons in life. I, I mean, th- this is, this is my, my experience is there are seasons where you've got all the stuff that you want to do, and it's like, well, yeah, but you know what? This is a season of testing. And you are going to be in the crucible, whether you like it or not, and there ain't nothing you can do about it, and you can't get out of it. Well, actually, you can get out of it. You can sleep with Potiphar's wife if you want. You can see how that deal turns out. Um, you know, or whatever, right? But if, if, if you're going to stick with your convictions, um, it's going to be a long, lonely road. Okay, and then the season changes, and all of a sudden, everything you do works. And it's the weirdest thing. Now, I know what this is like. I mean, you've heard my stories. It was like, you know, you're pounding away at all this stuff, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't work, and then all of a sudden, something changes, and then all of a sudden, everything you do works. You're like, well, how come I couldn't just have taken like about 10% of this good stuff and sprinkled in it? And, well, I don't know. <laughs> I truly do not know. But, but that... You know, but, but God is polishing our character. And um, I, I, I think that the, the polishing is necessary to keep you from screwing up <laughs> later, okay? Um, I mean, isn't it kind of scary... If, if, you, if you meet somebody who's like, they've gone from zero to a million dollars and nothing's ever really been hard, like, haven't a lot of us like met at least one or two people where it kind of went that way for them? And you're like, and you have a conversation with them and, and you, start to, you start to realize, man, this guy is like about as deep as a puddle, right? Like, he's like, well, why doesn't everybody just, you know? wake up and make a quarter million dollars a year. It's like, well, you don't seem to understand, do you? Right? And, and uh, you know, I think, I think there's a, uh, a process of humility that happens. And I think it's valuable. Um, you know, about, about three or four years ago, yeah, about four years ago, um, you know, Laura and I hit one of these stretches where uh, it was just one of those seasons of being wrung, wrung out like a dish rag. It's like uh, we'd been married for, what, 17 years or something like that. And, uh, you know, we had an okay relationship. wasn't great, but certainly better than a lot of people. And, you know, but, like, all of a sudden we, we get into this stretch where I've got these issues that I need to deal with, and, and, and I start becoming aware of them, and she's got some issues she's got to deal with. And just had to go through it. And it would have been really easy to, you know, to throw in the towel. Really glad that we didn't. We've, we've come out on the other side in, in, a, in a much better place. But, you know, we both had to do a lot of growing up. And we both had to, you know, um, kind of dig through the latrine for a while. You know, that's just one of the things that happens. Um, one of my... Uh, um, one of my favorite, let's see, how does this thing work? Um, yeah, one, one of my favorite passages is this one. Um, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now that is like the most counterintuitive thing that there is. So where, where you say, I, I, am, I am making a conscious choice to find, to, to 
literally take pleasure in a situation that sucks. Like, that's a, that's a, that's a head twister all the way. For you know that when your test is, faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. When your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not scold you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Now, we, we have a word in, in, in the marketing business, we have a word for that kind of person. We call them a bizopper. Okay? It's called shelf help. It's like never follow through with anything, just grab on to the next bright, shiny object and the next bright, shiny object, and where does it get them? Right? They can, go, they, they can, they can spend a, you know, the equivalent of a, of a Northwestern MBA on videos and courses and everything else. But it's just, you know, zigzag, and, and, the, and the inner world is just plagued with self-doubt. You know, if you could listen to the conversation. The conversation inside the head is the exact opposite of what you hear him saying. Man, this is great. This is going to be so good. This is going to make a million dollars. Well, the conversation inside their head is, this really sucks. I'm not making anything. I'm, you know, I'm an embarrassment. To you. <laughs> right? But it's just like there's... There's no sense of, of purpose or, or um, tenacity in, in what they're doing. And so, I mean, and it's kind of heartbreaking because I still believe that those, those people, they did have dreams, they did have things that were planted in them, they did have things they were destined to do, and what are they doing? They're drinking or they're, you know, whatever. Um, the uh, you know, here's here's another one that I that I like. Um, just give me a quick sec here. Here it is. All right. Um, the Lord your God is bringing you to a good land of flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. It is a land where the food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It's a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure and praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. And a little later it says, Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God, who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt, and by the way, you know, that ties back to Joseph, right? Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions. He fed you with man in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you the power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. Um, I, I really believe that, that God is m delighted to help people become successful. I really do. Um, I'll never forget when I was in Kenya uh, a few years ago and... And uh, this guy is taking me around. Um, he runs a he runs a feeding program and a foster care program for AIDS orphans. So kids who both parents have died of AIDS, their relatives would be willing to take them in, but they don't have any money. And so it was this program where they would supplement the income uh, of, of these families that would take these kids, and they would make sure that the kids were being well taken care of, and, and it was very good. Um, so I, it was kind of this encouraging but depressing trip of seeing, you know, all these problems that go on in, in Africa. 
And after about a day of this, I, I finally go, I go, you know, I'm like, charity is great, and, and what's going on here is great, but, but that doesn't, like, dig you out of it. And, and I brought up the subject of starting small businesses and microloans and things like this. And I go, do you, do you know anything about that? And he goes, oh, we got some of those, too. I go, really? He goes, you want to see them? I'm like, sure. So, um, so we drive over to this little market, and we get out of the car, and we go, and we walk, and there's this woman. She's got this plywood fruit stand. She's got all these vegetables on it. And he's, he, he introduces me to her, and I shake her hand, and he translates, and, and he says, hey, you know, we gave this lady a $50 loan, and she started this fruit stand, and she pays, her rent is paid, and her kids have uniforms for school, and, you know, you can tell she's, she's happy doing what she's doing. It's very primitive by American standards, but it, it's a real business. I'm like, wow, this is great. He goes, you want to see some more? Sure. So... So um, he takes me over to this other village, and we go into this cobbler shop. And in this cobbler shop, there's this guy named Paul, and Paul is crippled. And he's sitting there on the floor with his crutches up against the wall, and he's fixing shoes. And, and I start having this conversation with Paul through the translator. Now, when you go to Africa, most people that you talk to, they kind of have this blank dead stare. They're, they're friendly, and Africa's a, a, a wonderful place in a lot of ways, but it, it's, a, it's a very harsh, unrelenting kind of existence, and most people are just so worn down, they just kind of have this helpless stare, and you see it everywhere, but he did not have that helpless stare. It was like he looks you in the eye, and there's a, there's a sparkle in his eye, and like he knows what he's doing, and he's, he obviously has a successful business. There's customers in there. They're getting their shoes fixed. And his kids are fed and going to school. And it's like, hey, this guy, Paul, $100 microloan, right? Okay, this guy, Paul, is a little peller of economic activity in this village. And I'm like... My goodness, you know, dropping food out of airplanes isn't going to solve this problem. And, you know, sending millions of dollars to the government so they can stash it in Swiss bank accounts, that, that is not going to solve the problem. You know what solves the problem is people like Paul. And all of a sudden I get it. It's like, if, if you don't have entrepreneurs... You got AIDS orphans. It's that simple. So, so, and, and so I think of this like, wow, you know, I run this info business and I sell these AdWords books and I got all these customers that do all these crazy things, right? They sell all these weird, this weird stuff on the internet. And most of their friends don't really even understand what they're doing and, and, you know, maybe you like it, maybe you don't, maybe you approve of it, maybe you don't, maybe you can't fathom why anybody would buy such a weird... Why would anybody pay $150 for a leather notebook? Who cares? <laughs> okay, somebody wants it, and somebody's going to sell it to them because they have entrepreneurial drive. And like this, like it's you know the, the guy Paul in the cobbler shop, he's an alchemist, and you're an alchemist, and you're an alchemist, and you're an alchemist, and alchemy doesn't come from. Um, you know, digging gold out of gold mines, alchemy comes from ingenuity. It comes from wisdom. And where does wisdom come from? It comes from God. Now, I'm sure there's all kinds of opinions and all kinds of ideas about God, and, you know, that's like a whole nother conversation, but um, I have just, I, I have noticed that um, in in the entrepreneurial world that I've been in and all the people I've met, um, successful entrepreneurs are more likely than not to have an appreciation for that. 
and, um, and, 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 and I have one, one, other, one, one other thing that, that I think is a really interesting observation, and we'll, we'll switch to the next speaker. Um, back in, uh, it, um, there's a story in, early in Genesis, and God says to Abraham, he says, he says, I'm, I'm putting my finger on you, and I'm calling you out, and I'm going to make you into a nation. And at this time, they don't have any kids and, and all this kind of stuff, and they don't think they can have kids. And he says, I'm going I'm to give you a son, and you're going to turn into a great nation. And here's what he says. He says, those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. Well, so here we are 4,000 years later, and there's something, this is not really politically correct, but it's still true, so I'm, so I'm going to say it anyway. Um, there's 12 million Jewish people in the world, right, out of 6 billion, 6.5 billion. 10 to 20 percent of the top of every intellectual profession in the world is occupied by Jewish people. Um, in the 20th century, there were, I think, 121 Jewish winners of the Nobel Prize and one Chinese. Now, I'm not insulting Chinese people here, okay, but, you know, there's, there's 1.2 billion, billion Chinese people. Look at, look at the ratio. I mean, it's, it's the most, um, it's, it's the most uh, extreme example of 80-20 that I can think of. Okay? You know, 0.0001% of the population of the world has 10 or 20% of the influence of what goes on. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Now, um, you know, Christians consider themselves, you know, Jesus was Jewish, all the disciples were Jewish. Christians consider Christianity to be the fulfillment of, of, the Jewish, um, of, of, of the Jewish law and the prophecies and everything like that. Well, so here's another politically incorrect question that, that I like to put, to put out there. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the Jewish and the Christian side of the world, and you look at everything else, can you, I say, can you think of five non-Christian, non-Jewish countries, can you think of five that are not characterized by poverty, illiteracy, and human rights abuses? Can you think of five? Can you think of five Protestant or Jewish countries that have lots of poverty, illiteracy, and human rights abuses? It's kind of hard to think of either. It's like the 80 and the 20. Well, I, I believe it's because when God spoke to Abraham, like God really was speaking to Abraham, and there really was a blessing there, um, and, and that when we, when we ask for wisdom, it is available. Um, but sometimes it's delayed. Okay, sometimes there's, you know, a trip to the jail after the Potter for Wife incident, you know, or, or, or sometimes the brothers throw you, sell you to slave traders after your big happy dream that you just had. You know, and, and life is very, very confusing and very disillusioning. But, but, you know, there's things in your heart that you need to hang on to. And, there, and there's some things in your heart where you kind of have to go, well, all right, I don't know if this is... Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is going to come true. I don't know. But, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold it. Um, I, I'm going to hold it sort of with an open hand. And whatever I do, I'm going to do out of strength instead of weakness. Okay? If I abandon this project, I'm going to abandon it out of strength. 
because I just I, I figured out it's a bad idea. I'm not going to abandon it because I'm a coward or because it was too hard or whatever. How do you know the difference? <laughs> That's where you need wisdom. And, and so I think there in, in, in our little corner of the world, there's this obsession with knowledge and techniques. And like, oh, so, you know, I'm going to put this piece of code here, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, you know. And it's, it's this kind of scheming sort of attitude. Okay, and it's always shallow. It's, it's always, it's like, well, you know, that probably stops working in three months, right? You know, if, if you're walking in wisdom, the things that you do work for years. They might work forever. Why? Because they're, they're based on principles. And so I just want to encourage you, you know, every, everybody's in a different spot and everybody's on a different path, but... I, I just want to encourage you that um, when you ask for wisdom, it shows up, and it often shows up in these re really unexpected ways. Uh, my friend Tom Hubiar has this great saying. He says, he says, there's burning bushes everywhere. And there are. You know, Moses in the burning bush, the, the bush speaks to him, and it's actually God saying, hey, I got this job for you. Well, you know, those little clues are like everywhere. They're everywhere. And it's just a question, okay, am, am I awake and alive and paying attention? Or am I just kind of sleepwalking? So I want to encourage you guys, walk in wisdom, don't sleep, sleepwalk. We'll take like a, just a five-minute break, and Shelly's going to come up, and she's going to work her magic on you. So I appreciate you guys giving me your attention today. Thank you.